this. Um, that was a really good uh, lead up to my presentation. So um, we're a small organization based in London promoting electronics repair in communities. Um, but I'll start with why. So um, electronic waste is one of the fastest growing waste streams um, uh, in every economy across the world. Um, there's been a lot of attention recently to food waste, plastic waste, you know, a lot, of, a lot of attention to waste, which is all great, but not so much attention to this one. It's kind of like, oh, don't take away my new device, whatever you do. Um, and we got started on this issue without really knowing too much about it, but actually slightly more interested from this perspective of, like, are we, are we going to become this, this guy? Like, we, we weren't so... In fact, concerned in the beginning of the destruction of the world that Wally lived in, we were actually more like, wait, are we becoming that guy who can't even move, who has no muscle mass left, um, who doesn't, um, who takes, he just looks at screens and passively lives in the world? We also, of course, <laughs> were motivated by what everyone else is motivated by, which is like a huge amount of frustration and like, you know, why? Like, <laughs> why must everything be so shit and so hostile to us? Um, and then, I guess the more we looked into this issue, um, Hugo and I, my co-founder, we just really started to learn more about it's not just the mountain of electronic waste, it's, it's all of the waste that's gone into the production of the stuff. So like, even if we recycle that whole mountain of e-waste, and this year it's, I think it's we're reaching about 50 million tons, which is, in the world, is hard to comprehend. Um, even if we were to recycle all the materials inside of it, we still we still, and Apple's is a company that pr produces its own product reports. Um, they're not independently audited, but at least they do. Um, if you look at this, 80% of, the, of, of the, the emissions that are in the life cycle of an iPhone happen uh, in production before they even reach the consumer. And this is true of most all small electricals um, and electronics. Um, and so this is a huge issue that's invisible to us, mostly. Of course, there is the issue of raw materials. So, um, Currently, we basically, the devices are becoming more and more complex in material terms, um, but recycling is not keeping up. So many of the, you know, the, the, the new materials being used in the devices, there isn't a process to recoup them properly. So, and, and there are huge um, you know, environmental and social impacts of that. Okay, and then just the scale. I mean, it's like slightly hard to comprehend. Um, it, you know, it may be that mobile sales are are, are like leveling off or plateauing, but the fact that we're, we're, we're near two billion a year and, 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 and the, the sheer scale of that. So if you, if you model, if you take, if you do the calculations, and this is a very conservative calculation, the carbon footprint of mobile manufacture is roughly equal to the carbon footprint of a country like Austria. That's just mobiles. So it's huge. And if we were to use all the mobiles for one third longer, we could save carbon emissions on the magnitude of like a country like uh, Singapore. So it's huge. Um, then another thing that inspired us, I have to say, straight away, is that we were um, working um, in uh, Latin America and Africa and Asia with people, um, who and I, who just, you know, they would make absolute use of everything, hack everything, fix everything, um, from, from like a biro to, you know, power supply. Um, this is uh, Ernesto Rosa's work in uh, Cuba, um, and he calls this technological disobedience, the kind of the Cuban way of, of making and hacking. And obviously, we're not trying to glorify that the tough conditions people live under there, but it serves as an inspiration. Um, so we ran an event, a community event, like this is uh, six years ago in North London. Actually, this pub sadly no longer exists. Um, which is another story, but we'll talk, to, talk about that at the pub. Um, and so basically these community events were inspired by the repair cafes in Holland, but, but very focused on electronics, only on electronics. And what we noticed is that we were able to create a community of, of people who super enjoy sharing their skills. Um, there are talented people on every, on every street, in every community. And we were scared at first that, we wouldn't, that there wouldn't be enough volunteers but that was absolutely not the problem to scale. People really enjoyed emerging out of their rather solitary practice of fixing, um, fixing for friends, fixing for family, and actually fixing the community or fixing with other people. And from the beginning, we were encouraging people to share their skills, and we put to people who are volunteering that actually sharing your learning. So by teaching, 
you're learning. And there's kind of like, we're inspired by Paulo Freire and um, all these other ideas about like um, the, the learner and the educator. And we're trying to put that to practice at our events, but it's a challenge. Some people, not everybody wants to <laughs> narrate or repair or teach other people to repair. So here's how it works at uh, one of our events. You just turn up, you register, you hang out, and you kind of you enter this unique social space because there's no money being transacted. There, we don't really have a reference for that in our lives currently. Um, and you listen for your name, and a host will call you out, and then you're paired with a volunteer, and you really have to get stuck in. So sometimes our events are advertised as a free fix, and we're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, there's there's a catch. You know, you have to sit down, get involved. Even if it just means picking up a screwdriver, um, you've got to do it. And so these events spread really quickly. They also spread through the repair cafe and you know places like Access Space and um, I guess um, the tool library. I don't know if you guys have drop-in repair events, but your friends that are makery do down the road. Um, so they're kind of happening everywhere. These kind of repair events. So that's one piece of context. Is like there's this community upswelling of like of community repair, and we're just a small part of that. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about is that people at these events quite quickly get to this point of like, wait a minute, this stuff is made to break. The system is rigged against us. And so that's kind of really why we exist, because we could have just, you know, we could have just hosted lots of events in London and been done with it. But actually people in our community from the beginning started pushing us and they're like, it's not enough for us just to be quaintly fixing. We need to approach the system issues. So everything is increasingly small, black, and glued together. Um, and this is an issue. Um, but it's bigger than just that. Um, there are other forces that are assembling basically to prevent us from repairing stuff. So um, there's a big battle in the US brewing over what's called the right to repair. So you have companies like um, Apple, but there are others that are trying to um, force us to basically use only their services, only their, their spare parts. And they're going as far as um, like basically using customs agents to seize refurbished screens. So if you want to use a refurbished iPhone screen that you get from somebody in China, they're claiming that it's counterfeit because that, it's actually a refurbished screen. It still has the Apple logo on it. They're claiming that it's literally counterfeit. So there, there's all kinds of really scary stuff coming up from the US. Um, and in fact, Apple has tried this in Norway. So they actually tried to, to with a Norwegian um, repairer as well, sue him, and he won in court. Um, this battle is coming to Europe, and I just wanted to mention that um, Europe, there's a, in Europe, there's a huge opportunity around eco-design. So there's this um, circular economy package, which is like a massive step forward from our perspective, looking at, um, looking at not just waste, but resources, resource efficiency, um, the lifetime of products, all these very exciting things, like these really, really exciting things that on a global level could have huge transformative effects. This package um, is in all likelihood will be blocked sometime this week. We're, we're hearing from friends in Brussels that, they're, that basically the political winds have definitely turned against it, even though it was the commission itself that proposed it. Um, and if this is true, it will mean that this will only be addressed potentially, hypothetically, um, at the end of 2019 by a new commission. And we all know which, which way the winds are blowing at the moment. I think we're, anyway, we'll check out our, uh, our social media and our website. We're, we're trying to mobilize with other people to massively put pressure on particularly Germany um, and a couple other member states who are, of course, the UK, as you can imagine, the UK is causing a mess and so are the Italians. But um, <laughs> it feels a bit short to do anything here, whereas potentially we can mobilize in Germany. So this is the other thing I want to mention to you is like international cooperation between all these groups is really important. Um, so we hosted Fix Fest, which is this big, like the first attempt to get everybody together from around the world who's doing this stuff last year um, in London. So we had people from four continents and like mostly Europeans, but there were other people from all over and it was super exciting, galvanizing event. And we're hosting another Fix Fest for only for UK, uh, UK fixers um, next month in Manchester. But we hope that this will carry on. So, Fix Fest 2019 is already in the works. I, I can't tell you where it's going to be, but it's going to be not so far. And it'll be a global event again. So 
this keeping of international mobilization to share experience, to get better together, and to work on the system change is really important. And we're starting this um, kind of alliance of repair groups as well. Um, I'm going to finish before that. Before that. Um, so these are some of the players. We're looking at um, basically collecting data on repairs together so that we can kind of collectively raise our voice um, with decision makers. And as you can imagine, it's open data standards are not sexy. They're not exciting. It's hard to get people who love just to go out and do things in their community and who are just super practical problem solvers to actually sit down and talk about how do we log repairs? You know, how should we standardize this? It's, it's, it's a little bit painful, but it is going on, um, and it hopefully will grow. Um, so that's one to watch. And one of the other things we're doing as the Open Repair Alliance is promoting uh, National Repair Day. So I thought it would be a great note to end on to let you guys know that um, we don't yet have a Wikipedia page, Daria, if you're in the audience. <laughs> we were told, do whatever you do. Don't try and create, do anything on Wikipedia. The editors will strike it down. <laughs> anyway, by next year, our goal is to have a page on Wikipedia, but we already exist. We did one last year. Um, and it was really cool to see. We put this out in the world, this idea. And we had like repair businesses in Iran um, participating on Instagram. By the way, Instagram is an amazing source of like of, of repair inspiration. Um, small repair companies are sharing like super innovative techniques for repairing uh, electronics on Instagram. Um, so we'll be there again. We're hosting an event in London. There's events across the world, and uh, more companies are getting involved. So like your, you know, your Subarus and your iFixits obviously are there, but there's there's more companies that are interested in Repair Day. I mean, it's, repair is a huge. Um, as, I guess as the other speaker showed, it's like it's a huge part of our economy. We just kind of ignore it. So we like this to be kind of raising the profile of repair, um, also for policy policymakers and the kind of environmental profile as well. So if you'd like to hear more, and we have, there's more details, and I'd love to talk to you at the pub about um, Fix Us, Repair Day, and also what's going on in the European Union. It's always really confusing. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you for everything that you guys have done. Mm -hmm. And we have a round of applause for these guys. 